Welcome to When Time and Resources Are of the Essence, Archival Appraisal and the Library of Congress Coronavirus Web Archive, part of the Rapid Response Collecting Session. My name is Melissa Wertheimer, and I am a Music Reference Specialist in the Music Division and the Division's Web Archives Collection Lead. Thoughts and opinions are entirely my own and do not represent those of my employer. First, I will begin with the background about this project and the Coronavirus Web Archive. From mid-March to June 2020, staff were teleworking and participation in web archiving about the pandemic skyrocketed into the single site's web archive, a general web archive, not a formal collection. In June 2020, the library reached its crawler capacity data limit. All web archiving needed to cease, and it was announced that the coronavirus web archive would be an exception to that moratorium. The Coronavirus Web Archive's formal collecting plan was approved and put under the management of the Science, Technology, and Business Division. In July 2020, I was appointed to a group with colleagues across divisions to curate the collection and determine the course of action for the thousands of prior nominations. In August 2020, to address space constraints, I created an appraisal rubric for the team to uniformly and objectively address the backlog nominations and future ones. This rubric is the topic of my presentation. This chart has the names of my colleagues to recognize their invaluable work in both pre-collection efforts and on the formal collecting team, which is still ongoing. Our major challenges were evaluating over 2,200 prior nominations and that our limit for new items was 250 new seats. 200 for U.S. based sites and 50 for non-U.S. based sites. From my background as an archivist, I knew that the solution to address these challenges was archival appraisal. But why and how? Actually, those are the very questions appraisal answers. Appraisal theories, methods, and values help archivists select items of enduring value for preservation and access while also remaining accountable through documentation. Collection scopes only answer what, versus appraisal strategies, which answer why and how. In American and Canadian archival theory, appraisal is a process, scalable, iterative, and policy-driven. Appraisal is a process to determine what will be saved and more importantly, how and why those decisions were made. This isn't unique to web archives. It's scalable because it can apply from the institutional level down to scoping and seed levels. This is my theoretical adaption to web archives. It's iterative because appraisal can and should apply across the records life cycle, whether it's paper collections or web archives. And appraisal is policy driven because institutional priorities guide collecting focuses and methods. I do want to take this moment to also advocate an idea about which I feel strongly, that the technical actions we take as Web Archives practitioners can be reframed, performed, and documented as acts of appraisal, more specifically, technical appraisal in American and Canadian archival theory. Here are some of the many questions we ask ourselves that can be considered as technical appraisal questions. For example, is the web content in a format a crawler can capture? Is the crawl frequency appropriate for the depth and width of the website? And many, many more. And now we move to the specific appraisal rubric I designed for the Library of Congress Coronavirus Web Archive. The team agreed that using a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet would be easiest in order to account for technology challenges we all encountered when mass telework began. It was also a way to combine work easily later. The spreadsheet rubric I designed included basic seed information followed by archival values and characteristics that had numerical values assigned. I chose a rubric system in order to approach the massive amount of individual items as well as standardize our team members approaches. This document is also easily readable as documentation by a human once the project closes and clearly documents our actions. A screenshot of a small portion of the rubric spreadsheet is at the bottom of this slide. Now let's explore the fields. The first field is the proposed URL. This field answers the questions, where should the crawler start? What should be preserved? What is being appraised? It's a free text field with no numerical value. 
The next field is the country host. This is also a free text field with no numerical value. This information needed to be included for a few reasons. First, our collection limits that each corresponded to whether it was a US seed or a non-US seed. Also, the country host determines our internal permissions category, which in turn has a numerical value later in the rubric. Also, the country host may affect languages of collection items and thereby metadata overall. The LC permissions category is the next item on the rubric. The Library of Congress uses a permissions-based model for web archiving, as opposed to a notification and opt-out model. Open access licenses override the permissions requirements determined by our Office of the General Counsel. The permissions are twofold, permission to crawl and permission to display off-site. The permissions in the spreadsheet appraisal rubric were a drop-down list within the cells. You can see the list of the options here. Next to each category is the permissions evaluation. Journalism, the notice permission category, is important for the first numerical value of the rubric. The rubric specifically asks if the URL is notice permission. The guidance I provide in the rubric is that the notice permission category, which includes journalism, will take up space in the archive without being accessible. In other words, higher scores are achieved by not being in the notice permission category. If news articles were the majority of the nominations and rights holders didn't respond or grant permission for offsite access, then we would have wasted our crawl budget and items only viewable on site. This element demonstrates that you can easily build bias into a rubric and our bias was prioritizing access from any location after our one year embargo period. Next in the rubric is subject. There are two components to subject, the subject selection column and the numerical value column. For the subject selection column, the guidance description was that gap subjects are given priority for new nominations. This was a drop down list in the spreadsheet cell with no numerical value. The options were determined by the Collection Development Office's analysis of pre-collection content added to the single sites web archive, and the options selected determine the numerical value in the following column. The numerical value scale gave gap subjects the highest score of a two, high priority subtopics a one, and any other subject zero. This was a drop down list in the spreadsheet cell. And again, it demonstrates how biases and priorities can be built into a rubric, in this case, the gap subjects. Here are the subjects and high priority subtopics as assigned to the project team by the Collection Development Office and their corresponding rubric values. The next numerical value in the rubric is based on whether the seed was a top level domain or a single page. The guidance I provided was that an entire website preserves context of creation and provides more substantive information for researchers. A single page can specifically target desired information within a large website or group of documents, but lacks context. The numerical values rated single pages as zero and top level domains or subdomains as one. Note that some staff rated single pages that required a great deal of scoping as a one. Here on the slide are also examples of a single page and domain that both passed the Rubik threshold, but illustrate the score applied. And now for the second half of the rubric, the archival values and characteristics that I selected. I emphasize that you can customize your project's rubric of archival characteristics based on your needs. I purposely selected the most basic ones to truly get at the definition of whether a website is archival. Note that these evaluations are where the subjective nature of appraisal comes to the fore. It's not perfect and it isn't a yes or no situation like previous fields. You can see that all the characteristics in this section of the rubric are low to high numeric value scale rated one through three. Now let's explore each one. I'll include definitions from the Society of American Archivists online dictionary of archival terminology, as well as how I applied and adapted those definitions to this project. The first is informational value. This is a basic archival concept with which information professionals are all familiar evaluating usefulness and significance. For the rubric, my guidance was 
How substantial is the information throughout the website? Does the nomination contain details, quotations, multimedia, statistics, or embedded documents? The next element is evidential value. Evidential value has two definitions, but the first one in the SEA dictionary applies best to our purposes. It provides information about a creator's origins, functions, and activities. I adapted it to the following rubric guidance. The coronavirus pandemic is a general subject. Does this website document a specific event, policy, creative act, or course of action as having occurred? Next is uniqueness. Uniqueness doesn't have an entry in the SAA dictionary, but it's part of the overall definition of what makes something archival in nature. Why is it special? My guidance for this rubric item included, was the URL created during the pandemic for pandemic information and content? Does it contain information duplicated across other web-based content? And is the specific information on this website already represented in previously nominated content? Next in the rubric is authenticity. Authenticity, like uniqueness, is also part of the definition of archival nature. I adapted our authenticity's definition to the guidance is the information recycled from other original sources that can be nominated instead. I also selected intrinsic value for the appraisal rubric. I adapted the SAA definition into this rubric guidance. Is the identity of the content creator, whether an individual, corporate body, collective group, etc., significant enough on its own that the content should be nominated? Are embedded documents or media novel? Note that web archiving practitioners often advocate for web archives by emphasizing the ephemeral nature of the content inherent in its format. In other words, web archives intrinsic value. The application in this case already accepts the format of the web as baseline. Therefore, we appraise the content and creator of the website rather than the ephemeral format of a website in this case. At the end of the rubric is the item's final score. The highest possible score for any item is 19. Our team leaders combined all of our original rubric spreadsheets of new nominations together. They then calculated and determined the average score to be 16 and said that this should be the bottom score threshold for getting new content crawling while leaving room for expansion. This meant that any item in the rubric that received a score of 16 or higher could be included in the coronavirus web archive. The rubric worked and we're still using it. In August 2020, from the 2,200 plus prior nominations, 235 were eligible records and only 124 were selected for collection. Fast forward nearly a year later in April 2021, 328 seeds were crawling, which included the previous nominations and new content, with 255 seeds completed their crawling. And then a year later in May 2022, 216 seeds are still crawling and 482 are completed. This slide includes a permalink to view the live collection on the Library of Congress Digital Collections website. In addition to the wide variety of subject areas, the collection also has a variety of URLs, thanks to the appraisal rubric. I like to think of these websites in three categories. The first is new websites that emerged during the pandemic specifically about it. In other words, a high score on the uniqueness scale. A screenshot example of that kind of website is the American organization called Survivor Corps. This was one of my nominations outside of my subject area and many team members did need to nominate content outside their subject area to get the job done. 
A second category is websites the library was already crawling in other collections that had new coronavirus content emerging. Sometimes it was just a page in the directory, other times it was a subdomain, and in some cases content was deep or throughout multiple sections of a site. We chose to add these deeper seed URLs to the coronavirus web archive on a rare case-by-case -case basis. This example of one we did include is Pfizer's page about their coronavirus vaccine. The root URL was already part of the Business in America web archive. The third category of websites are ones that already existed before the pandemic, but like the previous category had new relevant content like pages in the directory or a subdomain. However, these URLs were not included in any collection to date. An example here is a screenshot of the website of the Blues Foundation, with the seed URL being the page for the COVID-19 Blues Musician Emergency Relief Fund. As a postscript, here are some blog posts of interest written by library staff about the coronavirus web archive. You'll find the Blues Foundation Fund in one of these blog posts. Thank you for your attention and please be in touch. I look forward to our conversation.